Hello, good evening everyone. Welcome back to My Abbey Fences and the European Fertility Society. We are back with Dr. Elias Sekos. I'm glad that you are back with us. We had a webinar a while ago, at least, I think three weeks ago. So I'm glad that you were able to come here tonight. And I hope you are having, I know it's been a long day for you already. Uh, I hope that you are feeling fine and are ready to discuss our very interesting topic indeed. Uh, how are you today, Dr. Tsekas? Well, I'm very well. I'm a little bit tired. And uh, I look on my screen, I look a little bit pale. So don't worry, everyone. Uh, this is just an artifact. I'm full of energy. And I'm absolutely excited to share my um, my, my, my knowledge on hysteroscopy and the application on fertility patients and patients with miscarriages. I mean, if I can waffle a little bit before I can start, I mean, when I, um, when I turned back from London to Thessaloniki um, in, in the late 90s, uh, hysteroscopy was a very new thing. Uh, at the time, um, we struggled to find the equipment in our hospital in St. Luke's, and we struggled, of course, even more to find patients. We struggled to convince patients of the value of hysteroscopy. And it took us a good five years um, before hysteroscopy was established, uh, in, uh, at least in, in, my, in my area in the north of Greece, but overall in the north of Greece and in the Balkans, as a, as a, as a viable minimal invasive method. Uh, for for a variety of um, of uh, gynecology um, applications, uh, not only for fertility but also for general female health, for diagnosing uh, um, dysfunctional uterine bleeding, for differentiating polyps from hyperplasia, uh, for for performing operative hysteroscopy because uh, uh, initially there was a lot of um, a lot of debate at the time. Uh, whether an operative hysteroscopy would be as valuable as more radical approaches like a hysterectomy. And thankfully, um, I think that my team and I, we, we, we added a small, small stone onto the uh, development of, um, of, uh, of, the, of the new approach of, um, of managing uh, by hysteroscopy, not just for diagnosis, but also for treatment. I mean, for example, for, for all the young people attend, attending the seminar, uh, who had been in the 20s or 30s at the time that hysteroscopy was being established in Europe in the late 90s. I, may I say that at the time, the most, uh, the commonest uh, indication for a hysterectomy, for a removal of the uterus, was dysfunctional uterine bleeding, which is a condition that is very easily and very successfully and safely being treated now by hysteroscopy. So hysteroscopy has been through the mill, has been through the debate, has been through the, uh, the challenges that most uh, uh, newly uh, introduced techniques are being uh, put on. And thankfully it came out as, um, as a winner. So uh, historically um, in the last 15 years onwards, from, from the mid-2000s, uh, from 2005 onwards, it has been established as, as a viable method for diagnosis and management of, uh, of uterine pathology. And of course, uh, a perfect example of this is uh, patients with uh, fertility and infertility issues and also with miscarriages. So this is a little historical uh, review and I'm very much looking forward to giving you uh, the rest of my webinar. We are glad to have you here for sure. So thanks a lot for that introduction. And now I think it's best to go ahead with our topic. Remember, you will have a chance to ask your questions. Don't hesitate, put those in the chat. Dr. Tsekos will answer them for you right after the presentation. So let's get, uh, get, get on with that, okay? Let's uh, have a look at the presentation. I think we can start, right? Yes. Absolutely. Really? So Thank good evening, so everyone, officially. I will try to keep my talk uh, about 20 minutes long, and then I should be able to take questions for another 20 minutes. And please write them down. Caroline is amazing in uh, distributing those, and hopefully I should be able to give you some answers. So it's um, my fertility answers uh, uh, later on. So hysteroscopy. I will give you hysteroscopy and miscarriage. This is the angle uh, which I will try to, to, to shine a little bit of light on. So um, what are the facts about miscarriages? 
the what's in the house of hysteroscopy, applications in fertility and miscarriage, and what is the evidence. And at the end of my lecture, I will give you of my webinar, I will give you uh, some literature as well to, to, to look on and hopefully get some more evidence for yourselves. Uh, from what I can see, there are some wonderful people on the audience and some uh, some patients of ours, members of our team. Hi, hi, Sylvia. Hi, guys. And also some some very nice and very very um, esteemed colleagues of mine. So I'm a little bit stressed to have uh, some very senior gynecologists listening in tonight. So uh, don't quote me, uh, my dear friends, but please challenge me if you can. So the facts about miscarriage. Um, now, this webinar is directed towards... Uh, the main audience, which is the fertility patients. So um, I will try to keep it fairly straightforward, um, fairly um, simplified, but also scientific. So miscarriage by definition is the loss of pregnancy under 20 weeks of gestation. This is the commonest um, form of pregnancy loss. On average, it affects about one in four pregnancies. And of course, uh, the rate of miscarriage increases um, depending on the on the age of the woman mainly, but also on the on the age of the man, uh, and of course um, the rate differs in different um, age ranges of women. So, for example, in women in the early 30s, it may be as low as 10 to 15 percent, and in women in the 40s, could be as high as maybe 30 percent, and in women in the mid 40s, it could be as high as 50 to 70 percent. And I'm always referring to women using uh, either women with either uh, spontaneous conception or following um, fertility treatments with the use of um, of their own eggs. Uh, the miscarriage rate in an older woman, reproductively older, um, say in the mid 40s or late 40s, is not as high as that if they're using egg donation. Uh, there's still a higher association of miscarriage with regards to the age, even if we use egg donation, but it's definitely less uh, on average compared to uh, when we use their own eggs. And of course, 80% of miscarriages occur within the first trimester of pregnancy. So whether we have spontaneous pregnancy or IVF pregnancy, unfortunately, we have to factor in for a significant chance of uh, miscarriages when we quote our success rates to our patients. So what, what are the reasons uh, why women miscarry? So there's a variety of reasons. I'm not going to go into the vast detail here. Uh, definitely, commerce, and, and again, the ratio or the percentage or the contribution rate of, the, of those factors depends on, um, on the age of a woman. So in a younger woman, the chance of a chromosomal anomaly is higher uh, and the uterine anomaly chance is, 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 is much, more, uh, uh, much more important than chromosomal anomalies and, uh, and equally thrombophilia or hormonic factors are less associated sometimes with age as opposed to chromosomal anomalies. So chromosomal anomalies are more uh, commonly found um, as a reason behind miscarriages in women of, uh, of advanced reproductive age. So the main reasons, DNA anomalies, chromosomal anomalies, uterine anatomy anomalies, thrombophilia, immunology factors, I would put it last here. I don't know why it came here. Uh, and hormonic uh, and metabolic factors. And of course, don't remember, don't forget that uh, there could be a combination of those factors as well. So patients do not come with a label, uh, so we have to dig in in order to identify those uh, potential factors. So hysteroscopy, I will try to be focused uh, tonight. I don't usually succeed, but I will try a little bit harder tonight. So what's hysteroscopy? I mean, this is a hysteroscope. This is a, a magical instrument, in my opinion. Very simple, very straightforward, um, uh, fairly inexpensive to purchase. Uh, at least compared to other advanced um, minimal access technology um, equ equipment like laparoscopy or, or robotic surgery. So it allows for direct visualization of the uterine cavity. So it goes through the cervix into the, um, into the uterine cavity, no incisions, no cuts, no scalpel used, no injury, just straightforward going in, very fine, 
uh, very, very small diameter. Depending on the type of your hysteroscope, it may be as, as, uh, as small as 2.8 millimeters in diameter. And through this, we can visualize the, um, the uterine cavity. So the standard uh, hysteroscope contains a camera, contains a flashlight, and con contains a potentially a working ch channel if we want to, to, to perform an operative hysteroscopy. So this is the, the, um, the schematics of how we do it. We use a speculum or may, we may not use a speculum uh, and it goes straight into the uh, uterine cavity. Please remember that a uterine cavity is a potential cavity. It's not an actual cavity. And in order for it to, to become a cavity, we need to flush a little bit of medium, which is either normal saline or, uh, or pure zool or, or water for injection sometimes. Very standard. Uh, fluid in order to dilate this potential cavity and be able to visualize it. So there's two types of hysteroscopy, diagnostic or operative. Uh, diagnost they, they can both be performed in the outpatient clinic. Now there's a lot of hype um, involved in where do we perform the hysteroscopy. I mean, initially it was a GA, it was um, a tube down the throat, intubated patients, uh, you know, heavy anesthesia and all that. Now, of course, uh, it could either be done without anesthesia at all uh, or with very mild uh, sedation if we if we have patients with uh, low tolerance uh, to pain or uh, patients on whom uh, we were probably planning to perform operative hysteroscopy. Now, here we have to be careful because I think we've, uh, we've gone to the other side of the spectrum in the attempt to make everything minimal access and outpatient and uh, cheaper for our patients. We cut corners a little bit uh, and uh, sometimes we're pushing a little bit hard in order to avoid uh, the, the sedation, the use of the anesthetist in Greece, for example. We don't have sedation nurses like uh, in the UK and other European countries. So it can be quite complicated and very expensive uh, to, to, to employ anesthesia, but sometimes this is absolutely necessary in my practice in most of the time it's necessary in order to give the patients the better experience because uh, you know unless you're, you're well underway in the procedure you don't really know uh, how tolerable the procedure is and in my personal opinion i don't think we should fight with our patients i don't think we should subject them to 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 fairly uh painful and unpleasant procedures in order to save them costs, for example, uh, of, of employing an anesthetist or of performing uh, hysteroscopy under sedation. So I think we have to balance um, the overall cost to benefit uh, for our patients. And as I said, in my practice, more often than not, I use the anesthetist, I use a mild sedation, uh, mainly because um, uh, even if uh, it's a standard diagnostic hysteroscopy, invariably uh, I may wish to do a small dilatation of the cervix in order to facilitate uh, the embryo transfer uh, if uh, the patients are undergoing IVF. And invariably I would probably like to have a small sample of the uterus, small biopsy, in order to have a histological diagnosis of, of some, some pathology like hyperplasia, or a small polyp, and sometimes, uh, more often than not, I also like to perform the microbiome testing since I'm there. So uh, this is perhaps a, a take-home message that, uh, although it sounds very uh, luring and very tempting to have a, an office hysteroscopy with uh, a local anesthesia or with no anesthesia at all, uh, in practice, uh, for, for a good proportion of our patients, this is not very, very nicely uh, tolerated. So here we can see all the advantages, of course, of the hysteroscopy. So minimal invasive procedure. I like the term minimal invasive solution, uh, which is even lighter than a procedure. No incisions, no scars, standard of care, one-stop care, diagnosis and treatment. Now, again, this is a little bit debatable. So how much we can treat in the outpatient setting, how much we can treat in the um, in the IVF clinic uh, is also debatable. 
in my opinion, I don't think we should be performing a very complex hysteroscopic surgery in, in an outpatient or in a fertility clinic setting for various reasons and most importantly for the safety of our patients. So I, I think we have to very carefully select our patients before they embark on a hysteroscopy procedure. And if there's a doubt about the complexity of the surgery of the hysteroscopic uh, um, intervention, I think they have to be aware that it, it may be divided into two parts, perhaps performing the diagnostic part in an outpatient setting and in some cases um, moving on to the operative part in the in the hospital uh, in the hospital setting so applications uh, restoration of the anatomy of the of the of the cavity um, since uh, hysteroscopy has become the gold standard in um, in diagnosing uh, the uterine cavity we have discovered more and more uh, anatomical pathologies that um, that we were missing um, in the early 2000s, for example. And of course, with the, uh, with the improvement of, of ultrasound technology, now um, we can very confidently diagnose and treat um, uterine anatomy, uh, congenital uterine anatomy um, pathology, like, uh, like diaphragms, like um, uh, uh, uteruses which are not uh, perfectly shaped, uh, and so forth by doing by doing metroplasty. So invariably, all these conditions can be treated uh, via hysteroscopy. Uh, the, 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 there has been evidence that hysteroscopy improves the overall uh, fertility of our patients, um, uh, irrespective of other factors. Good night, Electra. It's 9.20 in Greece, so my secretary is just going off home, and I'm very grateful to her for staying a little bit late tonight. Uh, also, we can do, we can perform um, uh, the full assessment of the uterine cavity, either in cases of unexplained infertility or recurrent miscarriages uh, case. And uh, a new concept that I would like to, a new to many of you, uh, may be the hysteroscopic management of the miscarriage itself. So, um, hysteroscopy has not only got a place, a valuable place, in uh, investigating uh, fertility patients after a miscarriage, but it also, in my opinion, has a very valuable role in treating miscarriages per se. So instead of performing a standard um, miscarriage management with the blind evacuation of retained of products uh, procedure, uh, possibly the last blind procedure that is currently being employed uh, widely, we can, uh, we can remove the retained products of a, of a miscarriage via hysteroscopy, uh, achieving not only a better result of our surgical intervention, but also at the same time, evaluating the cavity and therefore uh, the uterine cavity and therefore uh, eliminating the need for bringing the patient again at a later stage at, and uh, performing a, a, a diagnostic hysteroscopy. So I will, I will elaborate a little bit more further now. Uh, now, <clears throat> Um, next slide, um, the assessment of the uterine cavity. So th these are normal pathologies that we may encounter when we're doing a, a hysteroscopic uh, assessment. Thankfully, due to the, um, due to the high quality ultrasound uh, scan machines and to, to the better skills that we have acquired over the, over the recent years, uh, we suspect that pathology via scanning and therefore we prepare uh, appropriately for the hysteroscopic management. So if there's a polyp, we remove it uh, on the spot. If there's a myoma, we remove it on the spot. If there's a septum, we can uh, treat it on the spot, uh, depending on, on the setting, of course, as I, as I mentioned before. And of course, we do have the option for tissue biopsy, which is very important. Please do not forget the safety of our patients, especially for those of us who are treating patients uh, in the mid to late 40s or early 50s. As you probably know, the law in Greece now allows us to perform fertility treatment and IVF to women up to the age of 54, just under 54. So we're talking about women who potentially may suffer from uh, malignancy, unfortunately. So we always have to be aware 
of, uh, of the value of hysteroscopy in order to eliminate uh, the risk of malignancy. In my practice, I probably see a couple, two to three cases of, of uterine malignancy every year. And uh, you can imagine what would happen to those women if uh, that was missed and if they were if they went ahead and they had uh, successful IVF and if the diagnosis was delayed by over a year during pregnancy and delivery. So this is very important, not just for the success of IVF, and all, but also for the safety of our patients. Uh, so fibroids, congenital anomalies, polyps and adhesions. These are the main pathologies we treat via hysteroscopy. These are different types of hysteroscopes. Uh, different types of energy we may use. I mean, it's a whole world, and I love that world, the hysteroscopy world. Lots of equipment, lots of options, lots of, uh, of diameters of our, of our um, organs, uh, of, our, of, our, of our instruments, uh, lots of techniques, and of course, uh, lots of experience acquired uh, over the last 20-odd um, years for all of us who have been um, performing hysteroscopy daily. So, uh, with regards to, to the effect on fertility, it improves the fertility. This has been proven. We're very confident about this. Uh, and that applies not only to uh, operative hysteroscopy, but also to diagnostic hysteroscopy. We have um, studied in our, in our patients that we have actually presented at the British Fertility Society Conference a few years ago uh, in England that... Um, even with normal pathology, hysteroscopy may improve the, the chance of conception by about 10%. So uh, removal of retained products of conception, I think this is the new kid on the block. My team and I have been very enthusiastic about this because we have seen amazing evidence in the literature and it's, uh, it's the logical next application of, um, of uh, hysteroscopy um, um, hysteroscopy technology. So instead of doing the blind procedure, uh, we do a targeted procedure, targeted a section of the, of the pregnancy with better position, precision, minimal injury to the endometrium, and of course, uh, evaluation of the endometrium at the same time. So we kill two birds uh, with one stone. Evidence, uh, especially with regards to the new kid on the block, which is the hysteroscopic removal of, um, of retained products. Uh, the, the, there's an amazing meta-analysis by Vitali and his team and that uh, the section rate is more than 90%. Uh, in about 11%, there's negative findings. Complication rate, very, very small. Clinical pregnancy, pregnancy rate afterwards, very high. Live birth rate, very high. And the pregnancy loss, fairly low. So these are the advantages of this new technique. So keep that in mind. I hope you never experience a miscarriage, but if you do, uh, please discuss with your doctors the options of hysteroscopically managing uh, that miscarriage, uh, which improves the pregnancy rate, uh, the, the, the time to conception, decreases the complication uh, rate, and de decreases the reoperation rate and the bleeding. Um, these are the studies uh, for the, all the medical uh, people on the on the webinar tonight. You can you can screenshot those. They're quite important. You can see how significantly better the hysteroscopic management is compared to, to the standard, which is the normal surgical evacuation, blind surgical evacuation of miscarriages that is is being practiced. Uh, at the moment um, all over the world. So take home uh, messages. Miscarriage is unfortunately a possible outcome, either following spontaneous um, uh, conception or following um, artificial conception through IVF or IUI. Uh, there are several underlying factors uh, that may contribute to that. Hysteroscopy is valuable in diagnosing and treating those anatomical anomalies it could be utilized as a management tool for miscarriage in one time and it enhances, no matter how we use it, it will overall enhance the fertility and will reduce the miscarriage in the majority of our patients. <clears throat> this is the literature I used uh, to, to prepare this presentation with the valuable help of my research fellow, uh, Dr. Xidias, Dr. Manos Xidias 
who is the next generation of fertility specialists and I'm very much grateful to him. So you can take a screenshot of this if you want to, to, to extract more data. Thank you so much for listening and I'm full of ears for questions. Brilliant. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot for your thorough presentation. And as you can see, we have some questions here. Remember, it's time for your Q for the Q&A session. So if you have any questions regarding hysteroscopy miscarriage, um, yeah, let's go ahead. Let's see. The first question is right here from Sylvia. Before embryo transfer, do you recommend to do hysteroscopy? Is it true that after hysteroscopy, the chances are much higher for embryo implantation? Right. Hi, Sylvia. We have a wonderful Sylvia, who's a doctor in our team as well, who is listening in. Uh, so thank you so much for the question. Okay, I like to individualize, to be honest. I mean, I think that, um, uh, put it this way, in my opinion, performing an outpatient diagnostic hysteroscopy on all our IVF patients in an outpatient setting um, with um, either local anesthesia or mild sedation is not a big deal in the overall management of our fertility patients. So I would like to be, you know, to be a little bit provocative here. You know, I think that, you know, considering that a hysteroscopy is probably part of the standard fertility workup, I don't think it's very far from, 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 from being very valuable. Um, now, so this is my mindset. Now, on the other hand, of course, if I have a, you know, a, a 25 or 30 year old, a 32 year old young fit lady with um, all normal uh, presenting with male factor infertility, I may skip a hysteroscopy, okay, on, you know, before the, before the initial um, IVF treatment, uh, because the chance of finding pathology is very, very, very small. Um, but overall, because that kind of patient is not very common these days, so, you know, the majority, at least in my practice, the majority of the patients I treat are patients with multiple failures. I mean, most of them international patients, more than 5% of our patients are international, and they've had at least two failures locally before they come over to us. So this is a very select group of patients in whom the chance of, uh, of, um, of identifying uh, something in the hysteroscopy is fairly high, either stenosis of the cervix or or hyperplasia, which cannot be very easily diagnosed by ultrasound, or or fine adhesions that may not be visible on ultrasound, or endometritis, or suspicion of um, of, of a polyp that may be important, and so forth. So I think overall we have to consider. Uh, every time before the embryo transfer, whether hysteroscopy may be indicated or not. I think we ought to discuss this with our patients. We, I think we need to discuss with you uh, uncertainty uh, of diagnosing 100% by the scan alone, or even with the addition of uh, some sort of um, hysterosalpingography, either the high FOSI or the high COSI or the standard X-ray HSG, all of these techniques combined, they can never have a diagnostic, diagnostic accuracy of more than maybe 85%. And, uh, you know, we need to, to, to share our, our, our feelings with, with our patients and, of course, make a decision together. Now, for, for the older patient, for women over the age of 40, in my opinion, I think, uh, I think hysteroscopy is fairly mandatory. Uh, before the, before the embryo transfer, and of course, the value of hysteroscopy, I think, is probably there <laughs> for about a year. Uh, so within a year, uh, we're happy that we don't need to repeat the hysteroscopy. But more often than not, we find it useful. It definitely facilitates the embryo transfer, even if everything else is normal. <laughs> it definitely provides us with a tissue diagnosis of uh, normal endometrium without endometritis, without hyperplasia. <laughs> In cases of um, Additional pathology, it, give us, it gives us the confidence that the endometrium is normal. Uh, I will never forget a case that I had recently, a couple of years ago, of, um, of a lady in her mid-40s with, with um, a, um, 
a non-diagnosed non uh, uterine sarcoma. Uh, when on scan, she had what looked like a myoma of only three and a half centimeters in diameter. So, and we picked that up with hysteroscopy. So please keep in mind the pathology, keep in mind the malignant pathology, which although it's very rare, <clears throat> it happens. I mean, at the moment, I'm treating a young lady in her mid thirties with um, a stage one A endometrial carcinoma. She is a, a patient with obesity, with a history of polycystic ovaries, with endometrial hyperplasia, and with hysteroscopy, we picked up um, endometrial cancer uh, at, at a very young age. And she's not the first patient that we've seen with endometrial cancer in a young age. So <clears throat> keep that in mind, uh, that hysteroscopy may protect you from an, uh, from, from an undiagnosed pathology that could be dangerous. It's very rare. And uh, in case of fertility, it will most certainly improve the fertility outcome. Thank you, Sylvia, for your question. And that was definitely a thorough answer. Uh, thanks a lot for that. And as you can see, there's a thank you from Sylvia. Let's have a look. There's another patient here, Maya. Uh, you mentioned using hysteroscopy to help with embryo transfer. My first few transfers were painful, but six weeks after diagnostic hysteroscopy, the embryo transfer was barely noticeable. Sally again, unsuccessful. Is this effect on easing transfer some th something time limited or would it last for next transfer? Sure. Hi, Maya. I'm very sorry. I mean, I don't think that the embryo transfer should be painful. Um, I think if it is painful, it means that it, um, um, it's uh, difficult. It means that it's probably a little bit bloody. It means that locally uh, your body has produced um, all those substances that uh, uh, may increase the contractions of the uterus uh, and may be associated with failure. Uh, we don't want an embryo transfer. We, we want easy embryo. I mean, put it this way. Embryo transfer, I mean, I, I probably, I, I recently listened to this amazing, amazing webinar by Professor Irene Suter from uh, Harvard, Massachusetts. And I mean, she spoke for about two hours for the embryo transfer. And she was talking to, to specialists just, just, to, just to show you how important the embryo transfer is. And she mentioned something that we all know very well that I will convey to you that uh, even for a fully qualified gynecologist who is training to become a fertility specialist, it probably takes them two extra years of training before they are allowed as, as, as uh, fertility fellows to perform an embryo transfer. So the embryo transfer is the single most important, in my opinion, um, uh, skill and technique and phase and stage uh, of your fertility treatment. That's why, in my opinion, it should be performed by the most experienced uh, fertility specialist available on the day uh, in, in your IVF unit. That's why in my unit, for example, <clears throat> no one with any with less than, than, than five years of experience following the fellowship, following the fertility training. So no one who's been a doctor for any less than 12 years would be allowed to, to perform embryo transfer, just, just to show you how important that is. If I want to give you one of my favorite examples, it's like shooting a penalty. <laughs> you know, you have the whole team, the whole team and the, uh, the coaches, the, 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 all the preparation to gain a penalty, but then somebody has to put it in. You know, it's, uh, it's easy. Uh, we expect it to go in. Usually it goes in, but if it fails, it's a disaster. So, uh, and it's not excusable usually. I mean, it's it's a disaster. You all remember those uh, those uh, those um, those football scenes of a missed penalty. Uh, so that's what I feel. I mean, I think that embryo transfers should go in. They should go in smoothly, with no stress to the patient, no stress to the doctor, not stress to the embryologist, no stress to the nurses, no stress to anyone. They should be painless. They should be swift. Uh, we have, you know, when we do embryo transfers, we have, we count. They should take less than two minutes, less than 120 seconds. All right. Uh, the okay. catheter should be nice and clean when it comes out. We should be using a soft catheter because if I am to use the, the hard catheter, that's potentially difficult and traumatic. We should have rehearsed that a couple of times before. 
And yes, yes, the hysteroscopy is facilitating that. One of my biggest stresses is when I have my wonderful colleagues from all over the world uh, referring patients to me for IVF, and then the patients come over. I haven't done the mock transfer. I haven't done a hysteroscopy. Most of them have not done a hysteroscopy mm -hmm. because a hysteroscopy may cost a few thousand pounds in, in England and a few thousand dollars in, in the US and so forth, a few thousand euros uh, in the rest of Europe. And of course, it's not part of the standard care and it's not cost effective and all that. One of my biggest stresses is when I do an embryo transfer on a patient who I haven't seen before or who I haven't uh, done a mock transfer before, who I haven't done a hysteroscopy before. So I share your thoughts, Maya, and uh, I think you're a perfect example of what a difference a hysteroscopy can make. And one of them is an easy embryo transfer, and also the confidence from our part and from your part that we know that at least the endometrium is normal. I mean, there's so many other factors in investigating fertility that we cannot be 100% sure about. At least let's make sure about the endometrium and the, and the cervix that they're normal. Brilliant. Thanks a lot again for your answer to this question. Now we have a, a patient also from Ethiopia. And the question is, my wife is 25 still. She has not, she didn't have menstruation. All laboratory and HSG result is normal. Uh, nothing happens. Uh, what shall I do? Anything you can advise here. Hi, Kemal. Hi, Ethiopia. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure talking to you. To be honest, um, we have treated a few patients from Africa, but never from Ethiopia. And this is the closest I can get to a patient. So thank you uh, to a patient from Ethiopia. So thank you for giving me the opportunity. Um, I mean, basically, if the HSG is normal uh, and, you know, I, I can't believe that laboratory is, is normal. I mean, you know, invariably, it's either a matter of hormonal or anatomical anomaly. Um, so, you know, look in a little bit deeper uh, to find out the reasons. I mean, I'm sure that there must be a reason there. Uh, certainly, hysteroscopy may be valuable, uh, maybe a some more elaborate, um, elaborate um, um, laboratory tests as well. But uh, yeah, I think we should be able, in 2023, we should be able to find a reason why a young woman has, uh, has, uh, has no menstruation. Um, uh, yeah, so so keep 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 looking. Basically, uh, if I if I'm allowed to comment, uh, I mean there is this misconception. Uh, this is a misconception that in Africa there's no infertility. Unfortunately, there's a lot of infertility in Africa, uh, and although Africa is overpopulated, it's also it's also plagued by 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 serious infertility for various reasons. So uh, I wish we, we, we can help, and uh, I don't know if the European Fertility Society has any plans, but I think our, our patients, our colleagues, I think you know people in Africa, they need uh, as much help as we can um, we can give them, and uh, you know we may all start by by perhaps advocating that infertility is very very common in Africa, and it starts at a very young age for various reasons. So Africa may be overpopulated, but it mm. also suffers from severe, uh, severe fertility issues, and of course from severe lack of uh, of facilities and uh, and specialists uh, to treat that. So these people need us, uh, I think, more than anyone. So uh, thank you so much, Kemal. I hope I have helped you. If there's anything I can do, please send me an email. Uh, I should be able to send you a full list of what I feel. I should be done in your case, but I mean, the least I can do for you would be to, to help you identify why your wife is not menstruating at the age of 25. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, of course, remember, you can get in touch uh, with the Tsakos team as well. And let's have a look at the longer question from Maya, okay, of our previous patients. She has some details here. Um, this is off topic, but uh, she would talked about DHEA before. My clinic planned 12 weeks DHEA, 75 milligrams due to poor response in two previous cycles, four follicles for egg retrieval and two, three, three, four, too small, too big, age 35. I had a scan to assess baseline AFC before I really getting going uh, ahead with DHEA. As I've never had AFC by, done by clinic, only the AMH measurement, 
The day three scans showed a large follicle on each ovary and no smaller antral follicles could be counted. Could this be an effect of starting the HEA during the luteal phase? If this happened at the start of simulation, would it be bad for response? My clinic do not do baseline scans before starting the FSH injections only at day 10 scan before trigger. Should I be asking for baseline scan and more monitoring during stims? Thank you. Sure. Yeah, may I, well, I'm sorry, but I, I may not be very helpful. I mean, it's a very complex um, question. Uh, if I can just pick out a couple of uh, topics. I mean, DHEA has a, has a kind of a long-term effect on the, on the, on the um, sensitivity of the ovary, on the responsiveness, if you like, of the ovary of the follicles to stimulation. So I don't think it's that important whether you start in luteal phase or follicular phase. Um, we're all expecting now in Copenhagen in the ESHRAE conference in the, in the end of June to, to listen to all the new evidence on the DHEA and the types and the, and the duration and the timing of, um, and the dosage of its, um, of its administration in IVF. But, uh, you know, I can tell you very clearly that it doesn't matter if it's, uh, if it's luteal or follicular phase and you probably need to take it a, a few weeks in advance. This remains to be seen, the dosage and the duration and the timing. Now, baseline scan, of course, it's a, it's a pain to do <laughs> baseline scans. You have to provide a seven day service. You have to have people available. You have to be able to give appointments uh, uh, on short notice and so forth. Many clinics don't perform baseline scans for maybe some patients, many patients sometimes. Uh, perhaps it doesn't matter, but I think uh, for some patients it matters. In my practice, I don't don't start anything without a baseline scan. I wouldn't even start a first number transfer, never mind a stimulated cycle. I think it's very important to do a baseline scan. Uh, in my opinion also, and in my practice, I always double that with uh, hormonal testing as well. And why do I do this? Because I need a total confirmation you know, starting an IVF um, stimula fertility and ovarian stimulation is, is, a, is a big deal. It's, you know, it's, it's not something which should be taken very lightly. Um, you know, for all our patients, whether they live down the road or whether they come from Singapore or, or Australia or, 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 the, or the US. Uh, so it's a, it's a huge decision. It's a huge, huge responsibility to ensure that it's... Um, it's, uh, it's, it's normal, it's safe, it's uh, potentially effective to start this stimulation. Uh, and why do we need the hormonal test as well? For various reasons. I mean, one reason is to ensure that everything that we can do has been done. Yeah, we have baseline normal, we have normal endometrium, we have no cysts on the ovary, uh, we have no other pathology. Yeah, I remember other pathologies like uh, hydrosalvages that may just come up uh, or that they may appear if we haven't seen them you know in the previous months a uh, free fluid in the in the part of douglas an infection that uh, perhaps uh, would become evident a, a cervical infection even cervical pathology you know baseline is very important because that means that someone a specialist has assessed your pelvic organs before they they are they are uh, they are committed to to perform you know it's like having having a doctor of the team to just to check the athlete be, be, before they run the marathon so baseline is very important with regards to the clinical assessment and also the ultrasound assessment why is the hormonal testing important uh, for two reasons firstly in order to identify those gray areas yeah so perhaps we have a small follicle of 14 millimeters uh, it's totally different if that's if that is producing hormones uh, compared to if it if it's not producing hormones so this will help us decide whether we would utilize the cycle or not and when to stimulate are we are we going to stimulate today or tomorrow it's very important to assess whether the endometrium is still normal uh, many many of our patients they've had IVF assessment or pre-IVF assessment three months ago and they start stimulation now. So how do we know they're still normal? How do we know, um, you know, whether they have a small polyp that was missed last time because they had the scan mid-cycle or in the luteal phase and all that? So I think it's very important to have a fresh opinion about 
uh, patients before we start uh, their stimulation, before we start to medicate them, before we ask them to perform. And finally, sometimes, even in the best hands, uh, something may be missed. I mean, I've had many cases, and I'm sure most of my colleagues have had cases uh, where there was a persistent follicle uh, that was missed on the baseline scan. That's why we need the hormonal test as well, uh, because we would pick it up by the high estrogen level or a persistent corpus luteum may be still producing progesterone, uh, which would totally destroy the cycle. Uh, unless we, we, we take some measures on that. So in my opinion, um, it's a huge responsibility to, 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 to draw a line when we start stimulating someone's ovary and say, okay, today everything is normal, everything is hunky-dory, everything is optimal, you know, the, the pelvic organs are fine, the lady is healthy, the hormones are fine, we start stimulation. Thank you so much indeed. And there's a thank you from Maya again as well. And let's have a look. We have another question here. Um, sorry. So could the endometritis or endometriosis be noticed during the hysteroscopic investigation? Yeah. Hi, Marina. Endometritis, definitely. Uh, definitely, yes. Uh, if not clinically, it can be diagnosed histologically. That's why invariably, if not always, uh, in my practice, I, I take a tissue biopsy uh, when, I perform, um, when I perform a hysteroscopy. For diagnostic pr uh, purposes, uh, definitely I need that. So definitely, yes, endometritis, plus or minus uh, hysteroscopy with biopsy. And definitely no endometriosis, because endometriosis by definition uh, means endometrial-like tissue outside the endometrial cavity. Uh, we may get some suspicion of adenomyosis, which is endometriosis, if you like, of the um, of the of the of the wall of the uterus, uh, but definitely no endometriosis uh, because that is tissue outside the uterus. Okay, thanks so much again for that. And uh, how long the hysteroscopic result is reliable? For example, if the endometrium was normal. Yeah, thank you. I mean, this is a very, very clever question. Thank you so much. I mean, if the endometrial is normal, in my opinion, in my practice, one year. Uh, so if I do hysteroscopy and everything is normal, um, I'm, and I'm very happy with the scans in the next few months, I don't need to do it again. I don't need to do right. any further uh, interventions. If it is abnormal, depends on the abnormality. I think the most difficult abnormality Abnormalities are two, in my opinion. One is uh, adhesions, because if we have adhesions, no matter how, what, how we treat them, how good we are, how wonderful equipment we have, how huge experience we may have, unfortunately, adhesions may come back or they may be inadequately treated, not because we're not good, but because this is, this is the pathology in that case. So in case of adhesions, I'm always skeptical. Uh, and I always um, counsel my patients for the possibility of repeated hysteroscopies. Now, another difficult and challenging area is, uh, is uh, fibroids that may be, may be touching and distorting the cavity a little bit. Uh, and again, in those cases, uh, sub, we call them sub, submucous fibroids. Uh, so if it's a clearly... If, if, it's, if it's clearly fibroid within the uterus or a polyp that's removed, then that's fine, um, out of the way. But if it's, a, if it's an intermural fibroid, if it's a fibroid within, the, uter within the, the wall of the uterus that is touching a little bit upon the, upon the, um, the, the, the subendometrium, the, you know, the internal aspect of the endometrium, sometimes we have to reassess, especially if we're talking about a fairly large fibroid. Uh, so in those two cases, I may need to repeat hysteroscopy. And perhaps a third third um, area is it was also touched upon in the previous question is um, is cervical stenosis and how how do we treat cervical stenosis and uh, whether that would last forever or would last for a few months and when is the best time to do it and all that again it depends on the severity of cervical stenosis. Thankfully, 
most women with a cervical stenosis, they have what we call the mild to moderate stenosis, which means that with a, with a modest dilatation, because we don't like to dilate too much, uh, because then we go on the other side of creating an incompetent cervix that may be associated with miscarriages and uh, and uh, and premature labor, in particular with uh, with second trimester miscarriages and premature labor. So we do not want to over dilate. Uh, in terms of figures, I personally do not like to, to under any circumstances, to go be, beyond a, a dilatation of Hagar 7 or 8 uh, maximum for, for my infertility patients. So, uh, with regards to stenosis, depending. Um, in, my, in my experience, and it's probably a few thousands of women with stenosis I have treated till now, I would probably say that the majority, perhaps 70 to 80 percent of women with a modest dilatation to Hagar. Um, Hagar is a, is a measurement, uh, is a clinical measurement um, for, uh, in our practice. Uh, Hagar 67, that should suffice and would never create a problem in the future. For women with severe stenosis, especially uh, associated with adhesions of the cervix, uh, or women with some sort of anatomy issues uh, of their uterus or unicorned uterus or some sort of bicornid uterus and so forth, um, I prefer to stop at the dilatation of seven, maximum eight, uh, and then repeat dilatation if, uh, if it um, occurs rather than dilating them to nine or ten and risking uh, incompetent cervix. Brilliant. Again, thanks a lot. Um, let's have a look. We have a question from Liz. We had three implantation failures, one chemical pregnancy of Mexone egg donor and donor. We have been advised to have a steroscopy and a laparoscopy. Do you think laparoscopy is also needed or useful? Oh, right. Okay. Um, difficult, difficult question. Definitely hysteroscopy. Look, we're trying to be as... Um, as hands-off as possible. We try to be as less invasive as possible, uh, but then we have to balance also. Uh, we have to balance the need of uh, knowing uh, confidently of what's going on and not knowing what's going on. Now, Liz, you, you are a complicated case. I mean, three implantation failures is something very heavy upon your shoulders. And I'm very sorry about this. Um, so I think we need to confidently, in your case, know that there's no pathology, there's no any issues in your anatomy. And anatomy is not only the endometrium, it's also the myometrium, the wall of the uterus, and it's also the areas around the uterus that may affect your implantation, the implantation. So I think this, this requires a lot, of, a lot of discussion. I mean, yeah, I think the best way perhaps to avoid a laparoscopy would be maybe to perform a histosalpingogram uh, and uh, avoid a laparoscopy if uh, this is absolutely normal and if there's no suspicion of uh, infection or endometriosis. If there's any suspicion of those, maybe of those two or either of those two, uh, then maybe, maybe I would probably suggest a laparoscopy to ensure there's nothing that's going amiss. I mean, I, I can always, you know, people neglect, we tend to neglect the importance of infection onto the implantation. And we tend to, 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 we tend to neglect that in an infective environment, uh, even if this infection is not evident in the endometrium, even if it only affects the, um, an infection is inflammation also caused by endometriosis, yeah? Um, so um, we tend to forget that, uh, you know, if the neighbor's home is on fire, if the tubes are on fire, or if the peritoneum is on fire, which is the neighboring area of your endometrium, then your your home is at risk as well. So I think we have to balance all of that, of course, with uh, the notion of uh, of being as less invasive as possible. 
Okay, again, thank you for this. All right, Nadia has another question, and here's the question. So you mentioned that there's two types of hysteroscopy, one diagnostic, one operational. operational. Can the two be combined in one go if something is discovered during the diagnostic hysteroscopy? Yeah, sure. Hi, hi, Nadia. Of course is the answer. However, it also depends on the setting. So this has to be discussed with your, with your doctor. So, for example, in the majority of um, fertility clinic settings, we're not prepared um, to, to perform operative hysteroscopy, uh, at least from, from the middle stages onwards, so for pathology any more than mild to moderate. So this has to be discussed. I mean, if I want to make it a little bit more practical, um, if we do not expect to find any serious pathology, then we perform, I mean, at least in my practice, I perform the hysteroscopy in the fertility clinic setting. Uh, now, that means that in 90% of cases, I will sort everything out on the spot, even if a small pathology is identified. In a 10% of cases, if there is a pathology identified that I have not predicted, then I keep the value of a diagnostic hysteroscopy and I move on to the hospital setting to perform the mm -hmm. operative hysteroscopy. Uh, mm -hmm. The reason why, because it's more convenient and it's, more, it's less costly, to have um, to have a hysteroscopy in a fertility setting, right. and it's much more expensive to have it in the hospital. Again, you know, speaking from you know in our protocols, if um, if we we fall into the ten percent category in which uh, we perform the um, diagnostic and then we have to move on to the hospital setting, then uh, there's also some sort of arrangement in order for this amount to be discounted from the overall price. So generally we try to perform the appropriate hysteroscopy in the appropriate setting in order to be cost effective, but at the same time uh, safe and effective for our patients. Okay. Makes sense, of course. Again, thanks a lot. We will be slowly finishing. I guess we can get to have a look at uh, two, perhaps, questions, right, Dr. Tsekas? And here's the question. Uh, may the tubes be checked by the hysteroscopy on whether there is an inflammation or some abnormalities or whether there is hydro hydro something? Unfortunately, no, uh, Marina. Um, the tubes may only be assessed by, by tests designed to test for tubes. And these tests are either the hysterosalpingogram um, with the use of some sort of medium which is visible uh, on the radiology equipment we use, either visible on scan or visible on x-ray, or by laparoscopy. So neither the hysteroscopy nor uh, the standard ultrasound scanning uh, technology whether it's the standard two-dimensional or the three-dimensional Doppler scanning, neither of them, of them are designed to diagnose hydrosalpinges. They may do, but they're not designed for that. Uh, in my practice, it's very important to ensure uh, as accurately as we can, definitely more than 90%, that we're not dealing with hydrosalpinges, we're not dealing with infection. And may I say here that in case, that's why I generally, in order to avoid a laparoscopy, which is always more invasive, much more invasive than, and much more expensive than a hysteroscopy, I have, my compromise for, for my patients is a hysterosalpingography and then a hysteroscopy. So if the hysterosalpingography is normal, then I just perform a hysteroscopy. If there's doubt about the hysterosalpingography, then I perform a hysteroscopy and laparoscopy at the same time combined. May I say this here, which is very important. Uh, may I mention the block tube scenario? I've had lots of patients with uh, block tubes uh, in whom the doctor said correctly in some cases, but incorrectly in some others, that well, why do you need the tubes? They're blocked. Who cares if they're blocked and why they're blocked? Let's go and do IVF. I, I disagree here because blocked tubes may mean a serious infection. A serious infection may mean an infective environment for your uh, implantation. 
for your fetus. In an an adverse environment for the developing of a pregnancy. And I've I've seen nightmare scenarios. And the most nightmare scenario is not the failure of IVF. It's not even the miscarriage in the first trimester. It's septic miscarriages, uh, sepsis and uh, an inflammation, infection associated miscarriages that put put at risk the, 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 the uterus and the life of a woman at a later st- stage of pregnancy. So mm-hmm. beware of blocked tubes and don't settle for bypassing. Oh, blocked tubes, doesn't matter, damage, I'm not going to use them anyway, let's go for IVF. That's not, that's not scientifically correct. And, uh, sure. and uh, let's remember that in order to have a healthy pregnancy and a healthy delivery and a healthy, and a healthy baby, we need a healthy mother. And, and do not forget the value of uh, not only the uterus, but also the environment around the uterus. And there's a follow-up, okay, from Marina. Let's have a look. Can the inflammation be detected by hysteroscopy only, by making biopsy, or only by the camera? Uh, both is the answer. But uh, I, I, to be honest, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't hesitate at all. Uh, perform- look, what I see, you know, the vision is very subjective. You know, think of a beautiful person, a beautiful, beautiful scenery, a beautiful mountain, a beautiful beach. It's very subjective. Uh, uh, the clinical eyes of doctors' eyes are also very subjective either. So uh, please look for confirmation. Uh, and uh, th- there's this amazing uh, medical specialty, which is called pathology. Uh, these people have studied for a minimum of 10 years in total to be able to tell us the difference between endometriosis and normal endometrium. So uh, I wouldn't negate them by just saying, oh, this is a normal endometrium. This looks normal to me. This looks abnormal to me. Uh, the proof is also always a histology diagnosis. So uh, just vision is not enough. And this has been scientifically proven, of course. Uh, we need histology confirmation of either the presence or the absence of Uh, endometriitis and this is also not enough because now with the new generation and next generation sequences sequencing with the new uh, techniques uh, we can specify even more the type of endometriitis the potential cause of endometriitis and also we can suggest the potential treatment of endometriitis so not just biopsy (coughs) but also microbiome testing would probably be the gold, gold standard okay Brilliant. Thank you so much indeed. And I believe that was our final question for tonight. There are some questions left, okay? Um, But of course, we will be able to forward those to to Dr. Sakos, his team at Embryo Clinic, and I'm sure they will be happy to help you out. So I'm sorry we don't have that much time to answer all of your questions, but as I assure you that we'll forward those to to, to Embryo Clinic and Dr. Sakos as well, okay? (laughs) Hope that's fine. Um, And of course, thank you so much, everyone, for joining, for your wonderful questions. I hope that helped. I do believe so. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tsek, as always. You've been thorough with the answers, so I'm sure it's been useful. Any final words before we finish? Thank you so much for listening in. Thank you, European Fertility Society. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you to the amazing people listening in. I um, I'm, I'm, I hope I have helped um, a little bit to 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 uh, to unsolve the uh, the amazing puzzle of fertility. Hang in there. So there are solutions. Don't give up and uh, demand for your questions to be answered. Thank you so much for listening. Definitely. And I'm available, my team and I, to answer individually and offer you individual consultations if you wish. Thank you so much indeed. As you can see, there are some comments and thank yous coming up your way. Thanks a lot, everyone. Remember, we will be back on the 9th of May. We will talk about PRP uh, with Dr. Natalia Schlarp. So I hope you will be able to join us then as well. Um, that's it for tonight. So thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Zakos. See you soon, as always. I'm looking forward to some more events of coming up. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy your evening and stay tuned. Okay. Bye. Good night. Thank you. Bye.